This week on Worldview, the Quad together on Indo-Pacific cooperation, but differences remain on how to tackle Russia, China and Myanmar. We'll get you all the details of the Melbourne meeting. Hello and welcome to Worldview at the Hindu with me, Sohasini Heather. We are working together to seek to shape a peaceful environment where all the countries in our region that we work with so closely can enjoy their sovereignty. Now, the fear of COVID must well and truly be receding, given just the kind of cross-continental travel we have seen this week. Uh, the foreign ministers of India, Japan, United States met in Australia for the Quad Ministerial Meeting in 2022. This is the fourth in the series and is preparing the way for a meeting between Prime Minister Modi, US President Biden, Australian Prime Minister Morrison, which will be hosted by the Japanese Prime Minister Kishida in Tokyo in the next few months, they said in the first half of 2022. Now, they came out with a number of announcements as well as a joint statement signed by all four countries. Uh, there's much more on the website of the MEA or the Australian Foreign Ministry, uh, but I'll give you the, the details of where they saw their greatest areas of convergence. The first is their big, what is called uh, the, the biggest partnership between them, the vaccine partnership. Uh, plans to produce uh, more than a billion vaccines for the Indo-Pacific region, which are funded by the US, produced in India, and then distributed through Japan and Australia's networks. Uh, Quad uh, partners have actually already provided or donated more than 500 million doses of vaccines around the world. So they're adding up everything that they have given, and they have pledged to donate more than uh, 1.3 billion doses globally. So this is in addition to those vaccines that are being produced for the moment, Johnson & Johnson vaccines being produced in Hyderabad at a uh, manufacturing unit called Biological E. The second area of convergence, maritime domain awareness, the use of their common navies and their skills in humanitarian assistance, disaster relief as well. Um, and then uh, there is the critical and emerging technology silo, how to build a safe and transparent 5G network. This is one of the big issues for the Quad countries. Uh, they're also talking about climate change with a plan really to hold an Indo-Pacific clean energy supply chain forum sometime in mid-2022. That was one of the decisions. They're also working on clean ports, green hydrogen uh, networks as well. Fifth, and this was important from India's point of view, was on counter-terrorism, also maritime security and cybersecurity initiatives. In particular, the Quad said it denounced the use of terrorist proxies for cross-border terrorism, urged countries to work together to eliminate terrorist safe havens in India's parlance. This often means Pakistan in particular, also to disrupt infrastructure and financial crimes that sustain terrorist activities. There was a very specific mention of condemnation of terrorist attacks in India, including the 2611 Mumbai and then the Pathan court attacks in 2016. And they added a reference to UNSC, uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 2953 that talks about how Afghanistan must not allow terrorists to be trained and sheltered. This was, of course, done, uh, passed in the UN Security Council during India's month of presidency last year. So there were a number of areas where the Quad uh, uh, leaders that came together, the ministers seemed to really agree. Uh, and they reiterated that the Quad is only an economic coalition of like-minded Indo-Pacific democracies who are really involved in ensuring a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific, also a rules-based international order. These are the things, catchphrases that uh, the Quad has often used in the past as well. Um, but there were a number of discussions and perhaps during this Quad ministerial, more than normal, a number of discussions on various global developments. And it was here that it would seem that India appeared to have some fairly deep divergences. Uh, these came out not so much in the joint statement, but really uh, where we saw them, all the four ministers come together at a press conference in Melbourne, and they were asked specific questions about Russia, about Russia and China, about Myanmar, about Taiwan. Uh, and take a look at some of the areas where there was clearly differences between the US and its allies, which is of course Australia and Japan on one side, and India 
on the other. Uh, the first was, of course, that this comes amidst uh, growing Russia-NATO tensions over Ukraine, the buildup of Russian troops. Uh, Mr. Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, actually said that invasion could, by Russia could happen at any time. Uh, the U.S. and allies have obviously, were all very critical of Russia, but India has always pushed for a diplomatic outcome. And we discussed some of this in the previous worldview as well. Uh, and uh, take a look at that. But it is important because India has not just taken a, what looks like a neutral stand at the UN Security Council. It abstained from a vote on how, whether to discuss the issue. Uh, and this was something that Russia thanked India for, giving the impression that India is actually tilting towards Russia over here. Uh, so one area of deep divergence, uh, we didn't see it there in the joint statement. Uh, then uh, there is on China, US tensions on a range of issues from the Taiwan Straits, uh, China's threats against Taiwan, the South China Seas, human rights issues in Xinjiang and in Hong Kong, economic issues. Now, these are all areas of the West and China's differences. Now, India has always joined previous Quad statements that stress on the rules-based international order, ensuring that the South China Seas and the East China Seas don't see any aggression. There are no blocks on uh, a, a safe passage for everyone's ships to go through. But there have not been, these uh, statements have been aimed at China, but there haven't been any direct references to China, uh, as we have seen in some of the bilateral statements that we've seen between the US and its allies. India has also not allowed any public references to discussing its own two-year-old uh, tensions with China and the military standoff at the line of actual control. Significantly, even on the Chinese Olympics, the Beijing Olympics that started this month, India didn't join the US and other Western countries that called for a diplomatic boycott on the issue of human rights. Uh, eventually, a day before the ceremonies, India did announce a diplomatic boycott, but that was over China's decision to use a Galwan uh, PLA commander in its lineup of Olympic torchbearers, which India said was politicizing the Olympics. The third area where, it, again, it seemed to be some differences was sanctions against the Myanmar junta, which has completed more than a year in power uh, and the power it grabbed from the democratic government last February. And remember, and we have dealt with this uh, at various times uh, on Worldview, uh, much of the democratic government is in jail, facing very, very long jail terms. Uh, and the US and uh, some of the Western countries have stepped up their uh, sanctions on Myanmar. However, India has kept its relations with the Myanmar government fairly strong while appealing for a return to democracy. So while uh, at the Quad, Japan, US and Australia spoke very strongly about the need for san sanctions, about holding the Myanmar military to account, External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar actually came out on his own to say that India is disappointed by the turn of events in Myanmar. They certainly call for a return to democracy, but its policies are guided by its own concerns over things like insurgency at the India-Myanmar border, COVID, the spread of COVID, humanitarian disasters, the possibility of that, and added very firmly where he said India does not follow a policy of national sanctions. So making it clear, this is not an area India necessarily will stand with the other countries on. Um, then there are the tensions over North Korea. And I remember North Korea fired seven test missiles in the month of January. That's the highest since 2017. Uh, leader Kim Jong-un has also threatened that he could return to nuclear testing and uh, uh, a long-range ICBM testing as well. That would certainly put the Korean Peninsula on the brink. Uh, again, here India has taken a slightly different uh, tone from the rest. It's one of the few countries, remember, which has an embassy in Pyongyang and has been reticent on using quite the same strong language, where Japan and Australia are keen to make this a key area for quadrilateral cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken, right after this quad, in fact, is hosting a trilateral with Japan and South Korea to discuss uh, what's happened in North Korea and the intentions and the way forward. Uh, and the fifth area where there are some differences, the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, where six months after taking over Kabul, the Taliban is no closer to building an inclusive government, nor in giving in to demands to allow girls back into school. And while all Quad countries and other groupings have agreed 
that these must be done. A return to some kind of inclusive democracy must happen in Afghanistan. Uh, and no country has yet recognized the Taliban regime. India does remain an outlier when it comes to engaging the Taliban. Uh, later this month, however, uh, this is uh, the, the extended Troika meeting is expected to happen at the end of February. Uh, we hear from sources in, in Moscow that uh, an announcement there. The United States is actually expected to join that. It's a meeting of what is called the Troika Plus or the extended Troika that includes US, Russia, China and Pakistan. Um, in the past, Russia has said that India must be invited to these Troika plus meetings, but we haven't yet seen that happen. So what seems clear, and I, I gave you five examples of various global issues uh, where the Quad doesn't necessarily line up on the same page. What really seems clear is that while the Quad remains very strong on its Indo-Pacific commitments, the worldviews of the four Quad partners is far from the same. Uh, in addition, what seems to be playing out in the backdrop of this quadrilateral in particular, and could explain a little more on India's uh, particular stand over there, uh, the first was a, a whole group of meetings really. The first was Russian President Vladimir Putin met with Chinese President Xi Jinping in Beijing last week. Um, in a meeting where they declared theirs would be a no-limits partnership, obviously aligning themselves at a time when both Russia and China are under fire from Western forces uh, and, and, and countries in the US as well as in Europe. Uh, then we saw Central Asian leaders, so another part of India's close region, Central Asian leaders, five of them, uh, who also went to Beijing for the Olympics opening and reformed a commitment to the One China policy, said they stood with China. Uh, remember, of course, India has also been making its outreach to uh, the Central Asian governments. Then there was Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan who visited Beijing, met with Xi Jinping and signed a number of agreements, issued a joint statement, 33 paras long, India has objected to the statement's reference to Jammu and Kashmir. Now not just that, Imran Khan is expected to visit Moscow soon for a rare Pakistan-Russia bilateral. So all of these are playing out and as a result, India is keen not just to keep its independence on international developments and what stand it will take, but not to be seen as working with only one group. Certainly it works with the US, with the European Union, even with NATO, um, with Japan, Australia and other allies, uh, or Western allies, but India also remains in the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's standing by its traditional ties with Russia, it's made that very clear, it continues to import Russian uh, defense equipment, of, of course including uh, the uh, S-400, and even remains a part of the Russia-India-China trilateral, the RIC trilateral, where Moscow has suggested that Prime Minister Modi, President Putin, uh, could actually meet with President Xi in the months ahead. So certainly a lot of meetings to, to absorb, as well as those to look ahead to, and we'll keep track on all of those for you at Worldview. Uh, let me get you some book recommendations, and I'm trying to find you some newer books that have come out. Certainly the Quad in the Indo-Pacific has become a new area of a lot of new books. Uh, so the first is Indo-Pacific Empire, China, America, and the Contest for the World's Pivotal Region. This is by Rory Medcalf, who's of course a noted Australian scholar. He had a previous book as well, not so easy to find, uh, called Contest for the Indo-Pacific, Why China Won't Map the future. He has a very particular uh, view on events in the Indo-Pacific. The other book which I really do recommend in general is The Revenge of Geography, What the Map Tells Us About Coming Conflicts and the Battle Against Fate. A uh, superb book by Robert D. Kaplan who tells you really how much geography plays into geopolitics. Uh, there's the United States and the Indo-Pacific, Obama's legacy and the Trump transition, just how the US turned over uh, to the Indo-Pacific. This is by Oliver Turner. Uh, there's India and Australia in the Indo-Pacific. Indo Not so many people write about the Indo-Australian bilateral relationship, but here is Tejinder Hundal who writes about the dynamics of defense, diplomacy and diaspora, the three Ds. Uh, he's of course an Indian defense scholar. Uh, and then there are a number of collected essays. Uh, these are uh, academic works, you might find them at uh, only at a library, but very interesting collations on what's the latest on the Indo-Pacific, 
Uh, one is Asia's New Geopolitics, Essays on Reshaping the Indo-Pacific by Michael R. Oslin. If that sounds familiar, it's because I've recommended his other book in the past. Uh, that's called The End of the Asian Century. Uh, then there's another collection called Conflict and Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, New Geopolitical Realities, edited by Ash Rossiter, and I think an Australian scholar, as well as uh, uh, Mr. Rossiter, Professor Rossiter, the Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi. And then there's a book called China, India, Japan in the Indo-Pacific, very interesting ideas, interests and infrastructure. Uh, and this is from the Institute of Defense and Strategic Analysis in Delhi, uh, the, edited by Jagannath Panda. So there's a lot to think about and a lot of reading material we hope you will enjoy from the team here. That's all we have time for, but thanks for watching.